Hi, I'm Tawny Plattis, and you're listening to Dirty Bits, the show that covers the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories from history your teacher probably left out. We'd like to take just a second to welcome our newest love bugs to the show, Ruth Inez, Vanessa, Natalie, and the acid-blooded Floridian Diane Student of the fantastic History Goes Bump podcast. And to anyone else whose little notification thingy I missed on Facebook, you are so welcome. A giant thank you to our newest Dirty Birdies who have donated on Patreon. Stacy Benedict, Lee Gebhardt, Thor Michael Wood, Aaron Kurland, Dennis Sarah, and the True Crime Fan Club. We are seriously overwhelmed by your generosity and are so excited to start sending you all of the patron-only goodies we've been storing for you. And so many thanks to some of our biggest love bugs, Sarah Cusick, Lindy Beaumont, Donna McCune, Heather Popley, Karen McClellan, and Jessalyn Ray Wofford for joining in on the Dirty Bits discussion and sharing the show with the new love bugs. And we can't thank our fellow podcasters enough. Mike Brown of the Always Chilling, Pleasing Terrors podcast, Dina Marie of the Fascinating Twisted Philly podcast, Hannah Ostick of the Side Splitting podcast, Film Roast, Stephen Pappas of the Incredibly Supportive Is This Adulting podcast, Aaron of the Sharp as Nails Brawless podcast, Allie of the Brilliant Insight podcast, Paul Somo of the Hilarious podcast Varmints, Lainey Hobbs of the True Crime Fan Club podcast, who happens to be my favorite voice in podcast land and the Claire to my D. And of course, the incomparable Jeremy Collins of podcasts we listen to. Thank you so much for all of the kindness and love you spread, not only in the Dirty Bits community, but the podcast community as well. There are so many of you we'd love to mention, and we'll try to get to each one of you in subsequent episodes. We absolutely love all of you. Be sure to join in on the Dirty Bits discussion on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Dirty Bits Podcast, and in our Facebook discussion group, the Dirty Bits Podcast group, where we post art history memes and talk all things historically filthy. You can also connect with us on Instagram at Dirty Bits Podcast and Twitter at the Dirty Bits Pod. We love talking with our listeners and would be delighted if you joined in with us. You might even get a shout out on our next episode. All of our links are available in the show notes here and on our website, tawnyvoice.com slash dirtybits. We've also joined the Orbital Jigsaw Network along with some other shows we think you'd like, like Concession Stand, a high-energy, fast-paced, one-hour weekly show full of quips, jokes, and updates on all things geektainment centered around TV, movies, video games, and pop culture. Check it out at orbitaljigsaw.com. Many of you have, in fact, requested longer, bigger, more frequent episodes. We would absolutely love to bring the show to you full-time. And if that's something you would like to see, you can help us work towards making that a reality by visiting us at patreon.com slash dirtybits and becoming an official Dirty Birdie. Every one of your contributions to the show means so much, especially to those who aren't able to donate. And George and I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Stay tuned after the show to hear some promos from some other indie podcasters we're buddies with and discover a new podcast for your playlist. Enjoy the show. His title was Philippe I, Duke of Orleans, but as the younger brother of the king, he was known simply as Monsieur. He loved all things etiquette, architecture, fashion, dancing, court society, art, and was an incredibly skilled military commander. He also had many, many boyfriends and frequently cross-dressed. There's French again in this one, love bugs, and my mastery of the language is comparable to about a three-year-old's, so pardon my abominable pronunciation. Philippe was born on September 21st, 1640 in France, the second son to the ruling king. His brother was Louis, the Dauphin of France, and he would inherit the throne before he turned three. This meant Philippe was second in line for the throne and carried the title of Royal Highness. 
So Philippe's brother becomes king of France in 1643, when he's just getting the whole, like, talking thing down, which means their mom, Queen Anne, was supposed to share power with Cardinal Mazarin, who had been the late king's chief minister. But she went, mm, yeah, that's not going to work for me. I'm going to be regent. And she took full control of her children, something she'd been working towards since their birth. She still kept Mazarin on, though, to help her run things. They were so tight, in fact, there were rumors that they were canoodling, had married in secret, and that the young king was actually fathered by Mazarin instead of Anne's late husband. But as far as I know, Ancestry.com has also yet to check this one out and has still only investigated our pal Warren G. Harding and his little friend Jerry. As a child, Philippe was considered attractive and intelligent. A duchess described him as the prettiest child in the world, and Queen Anne's bestie, Madame de Montville, said he showed a lively intelligence very early in his youth. Philippe had a total helicopter mom. Even into his adolescence and adulthood, he was always under her watch. Queen Anne was like, we do not want a repeat of that gnarly civil war for the crown that happened last time with the last king. We don't need the bickering and the fighting, so we need to make sure Philippe doesn't get any ideas about overthrowing his brother, and I think the best way to do that would be to make him wear a dress. She called her son, my little girl, and encouraged him to wear feminine clothing or cross-dress into adulthood. He hung out with girls and partook in activities that, at the time, were decidedly feminine. He had a buddy, Francois de Chaussy, whose mother also dressed him in girls' fashions. Chaussy said in his memoirs, Monsieur, who liked all of that, referring to ear piercings, diamonds, and beauty spots, was always very friendly with me. As soon as he arrived, followed by the nieces of Cardinal Mazarin and the ladies of the queen, they began to dress him and arrange his coiffure. His jacket was removed so that he could put on the coats and skirts of women. Francois himself had an interesting life. He was born to his mother when she was in her 40s, and he was her fourth son. She may have raised him as the daughter she had always wanted, or tried to endear herself to the queen by having her son cross-dress as well. He was very clearly raised a girl and never rebelled against it, going out in the town to theater and dances with his mother as her daughter. But he still had all the advantages of being a man in addition to being of higher status than average. When going to the Sorbonne to complete his theology degree, he was like, yeah, I have no idea what I'm doing. And they go, oh, no problem. Here's the questions ahead of time. After that, he returned to Paris. And when his mother died, he did attempt to live as a man, but was so often mistaken as a woman, he just went, fuck it, and put the dress back on. He actually bought a house in a city where nobody knew him and pretended to be a rich, young widow. He got his jollies from cross-dressing and was particularly titillated when pubescent girls were attracted to him. Francois convinced the mother of one girl he had had his eye on to allow her daughter to stay with him for a week so he could teach her the Parisian style of hairdressing. The mother was much poorer than Francois and was like, oh my gosh, yes, of course my daughter can stay with you, stranger. Francois and the young girl shared a bed and the hairdressing lessons took an unexpected several weeks to complete. <laughs> after that, a string of girls followed. He also found himself being sought after by men. And while he was flattered and enjoyed the attention, he didn't seem to fancy the D quite as much as his friend Philippe and turned them all down. But Francois slipped up when he got a young actress, Rosalie, pregnant. Prior to her pregnancy, he got a kick out of dressing her as a man and would tell everyone she was his husband. He was actually really cool about the whole baby part, taking the actress to Paris to be cared for by a midwife. He assumed financial responsibility for what turned out to be his daughter. And then he gave Rosalie a pretty fair-sized dowry to marry another actor. He then took some time off from cross-dressing. And since part of his memoirs are missing, it's a little unclear as to what happened next precisely. We do know that he eventually bought a house in a suburb of Paris, repierced his ears, got some new corsets, and resumed his life as a woman, while his neighbors just went, that crazy rich kook. Francois was very self-aware, writing, I have carefully considered whence came such a bizarre taste, and here's my explanation. 
The attribute of God is to be loved, adored. Man, as far as the weakness of his nature allows, wishes for the same. But as it is beauty that kindles love, and since that is usually the lot of women, when it happens that men have, or believe themselves to have, certain traits of beauty, they try to enhance them by the same methods that women use, which are most becoming. They feel the inexpressible pleasure of being loved. I have felt this more than once during a delightful affair. When I was at the ball or the theater, wearing my beautiful robes de chambre, diamonds and patches, and heard people murmur near me, there is a lovely woman. I experienced an inward glow of pleasure, which is incomparable, it is so strong. Ambition, riches, even love do not equal it because we always love ourselves more deeply than we love others. Philippe, Duke of Orleans, also embraced the feminine for the rest of his life. Francois said that in the evening, Monsieur would put on his long earrings, beauty patches, and gaze longingly, lovingly in the mirror at his own reflection. Another contemporary called him the silliest woman who ever lived. And he was also the expert at court when it came to ladies' underwear, which he is said to have worn often. Philippe would attend balls and parties in ladies' clothes, dressed once as a shepherdess, for example. And everyone was pretty chill about it because of the whole brouhaha that had come before when his dad was king. His dad's brother had committed treason by eloping with a foreign princess, and there was also all that fighting for the crown, so everyone was like, eh, less bullshit to worry about if he's gay. In 1658, there was a rumor going around that Mazarin, who's the guy who's supposedly stripping Philippe's mom and helping to run the country, has this nephew, also named Philippe, who was the first to introduce Monsieur to the Italian vice, which was slang for homosexuality. I couldn't help but be reminded of my favorite little dirty bit, John Wilmot, who also called the dildos Signor. I'll be investigating what the Italians have to do with all these dirty bits of history and hopefully have a future episode for you love bugs about that. Monsieur then moved on to Philippe de Lorraine because there were apparently only three names in circulation at the time and the two became lovers for the rest of his life. In fact, Lorraine and Monsieur would make public appearances with the latter dressed as a woman. Lorraine was a bit younger, beautiful, and supposedly had total control over Monsieur. An excerpt from Dirk van der Crusay's Madame Palatine says, as greedy as a vulture, this cadet of the French branch of the House of Lorraine had by the end of the 1650s hooked Monsieur like a harpooned whale. The young prince loved him with a passion that worried Madame Henrietta and the court bishop, Cosnac. But it was plain to the king that thanks to the attractive face and sharp mind of the good-looking chevalier, he would have his way with his brother. And while this was what the queen had wanted, she also was like, you still have to pop out a couple of kids. I'm not saying you have to break up with your boyfriend. I'm just saying we need royal babies, so pop to it. Let's get you wifed up. He married his first cousin, Henrietta of England, and the marriage was not a happy one. Henrietta was super cute and super flirty, especially with Monsieur's brother, the king. There were later even rumors that Henrietta's first child was actually the product of her relationship, not with Philippe, but with his brother. Monsieur was kind of weirdly jealous and complained to his mom, the queen, who reprimanded her daughter-in-law and the king. So Henrietta goes, inappropriate, got it and then proceeds to seduce Monsieur's old lover, the Comte de Guiche. And again, Monsieur goes to the queen and says, Mom, she's sleeping with other guys again. And Queen Anne goes, so are you. But she banishes the Comte anyway because you can't say no to your kids. In 1662, Henrietta gives birth to their first child, a daughter, Marie Louise, and she was so bummed she didn't have a son. She actually straight up said, throw her into the river. And Grandma Queen Anne was like, the actual fuck, bitch? Because she positively adored her first granddaughter, and Monsieur happened to agree. 
calling Marie Louise his favorite child. Never one to miss a chance to dress up, the day Marie Louise was baptized, Monsieur also took part in the famous Carousel de Louvre, where he dressed up as the King of Persia, alongside his brother, who went as the King of the Romans. Then in 1670, Henrietta goes up to the king, and she's like, Babe, I'm sure she was whispering this in bed at night, Babe, that Lorraine guy is always at the house. It's embarrassing. He told me the other day that he could get Philippe to divorce me. Can you do something about him? And the king goes, absolutely, of course. And he banishes Lorraine, the love of Monsieur's life, to Rome. So Philippe goes, oh, you want to play that game? And he drags Henrietta to his estate away from court and the king. He then begs and pleads with his older brother to bring back Lorraine, which she finally does. Henrietta also had taken part in that secret Treaty of Dover thing, which resulted in the Third Anglo-Dutch War, and when she got back to France, Philippe was, like, up to here with her bullshit. So she dips for St. Cloud, and when she arrives, goes, Oh my god, my stomach is killing me. I have this horrendous pain in my side. I'm gonna take it easy for a few days, you guys. She then collapses on the terrace, freaking out that she's poisoned, and then dies at the age of 26 in June of 1670. So everyone is like, Lorraine poisoned her. Holy shit, get the popcorn. This is literally some dynasty drama. But the doctor does an autopsy and goes, no, she had a perforated ulcer that caused peritonitis. Calm your tits, everyone. Philippe can't even pretend to be sad and starts looking around for another wife to fill the vacant place, as he says, really just needing a male heir to continue the Orleans line. He finally settles on the Protestant princess, Palatine Elizabeth Charlotte, who was called Lisolette. She was 19, robust, intelligent, not exactly considered beautiful with wild curly hair. She had a large nose and a flat forehead. But she was also witty, had a great sense of humor, preferred guns to needlework, was labeled a mannish tomboy, and was also extremely maternal. She became enormously popular in the court, known for her candor, character, and complete lack of vanity. She sounded absolutely lovely by all accounts. But despite this, when Philippe first saw her, he was a dick and was quoted as saying, how will I ever be able to sleep with her? It was known that Monsieur found intercourse with women incredibly challenging, and he had to resort to the mediation of higher power to accomplish his aim. But somehow he pulled it off. They miraculously produced three children together. Lisa Lott later said that he always brought a rosary to bed, hung with holy medals, so he could say his prayers. So one night, she hears all this clanking under the blanket, and she goes, What the fuck are you doing under there? And he goes, Nothing. So she gets up and shines her nightlight into the bed where she sees him clutching the rosary to his dirty bits and says without skipping a beat, You do not persuade me at all, Monsieur, that you are honoring the Virgin by placing her image on those parts destined to relieve virginity. So he busts up laughing, of course, and goes, Oh my God, please don't tell anyone. And she didn't for 40 years. From what I can tell, Despite the circumstances, the arrangement wasn't too terrible, and they got along pretty well. After they had had their third child, they went, we good to have our own beds now? Yes? Beautiful, let's start this evening. Poor Lisa Lett later wrote, when Monsieur slept in my bed, I was always obliged to lie on the very edge and often fell out in my sleep. Monsieur couldn't bear to be touched, and if I stretched out my foot and accidentally brushed against him in my sleep, he would wake me up and berate me for half an hour Really, I was very glad when he decided to sleep in his own room and let me lie peacefully, without fear of falling out or being scolded. She was able to enjoy her life with her children. History often remembers Monsieur Philippe I, Duke of Orleans, as effeminate and silly. Even at the age of 50, an observer described Philippe as always adorned like any woman, covered with rings and bracelets and gems, with a long black powdered wig brought very much forward and ribbons wherever he could put them, exhaling perfumes of every kind and cleanliness itself in all details. 
and he simpered in the most marvelous way and applied makeup so his beauty was more suited to a princess than to a prince. However, much to the surprise of many, he took an active part in the War of Devolution in 1667. He battled it out in the trenches and distinguished himself through valor and coolness under fire. But he became bored, and he actually did this, was more interested in decorating his tent. Then his wife fell ill and almost died due to a miscarriage, so he boogied back to stay with her until she recovered. He then went back to the battlefield and yet again distinguished himself in the Siege of Lille. In 1676 and 1677, he again took part in sieges and was promoted to the rank of lieutenant general, second in command to the king himself. His most impressive victory was one under his command during the Battle of Castle, where he did some super cool fighty war shit. So everyone is losing their minds at the skill he has as a commander, but the king is super annoyed because Philippe is now not only popular at court, but popular in the battlefield as well. So Monsieur is like, whatevs, I want to get back to partying anyway. To sum up, the leading dude in the military at the time, the best there was, the top dog, the guy everyone loved, was a gay, cross-dressing, effeminate man. And somehow, it totally worked. It wasn't an issue in 17th century France. So in 17th century France, the fact that a guy who often dressed like a gal and liked other guys served in the military, and it wasn't a big deal, 340 years ago. So anyway, Philippe retires from his illustrious and impressive military career. He went on to focus on expanding his estates, personal fortune, and art collection. He patronized artists like Jean Nocré and Pierre Minard, and musicians like Angelbert, Dumont, Arlaud, and Marie Aubry. He began a small art collection that would become the Orleans Collection, one of the most important art collections ever assembled. He then souped up the Chateau de Saint-Cloud, which was eventually sold to his great-granddaughter, Marie Antoinette, in 1785. He was also responsible for the Canal des Orleans, a large canal that connected the Loire River at Orleans to a junction with the Canal des Longs at the Canal des Brères in the village of Bug, near Montaigris. It was the largest canal built in France since Philippe's grandfather, Henry IV, built the Canal des Brères in 1604, and its construction was considered an engineering feat. The canal was used to transport goods from Orleans to Paris and was a great success in its time. In fact, it's still used widely today. Philippe's careful investment and management of his various estates made him a wealthy man in his own right, and his fortune grew even larger at the death of his cousin, Mademoiselle, in 1693. He's acknowledged as being not only the biological founder of the House of Orleans, but as the financial founder of the entire family. In 1701, after getting into an argument with his brother, the king, Philippe returned home, royally pissed off, and collapsed onto his son after suffering a fatal stroke on June 9th, when he was 60 years old. When the king heard his only sibling had died, he said, I cannot believe I will never see my brother again. The Duchess of Burgundy, his granddaughter, was also devastated, saying she had loved Monsieur very much. Philippe's heart was taken to the Val de Grace convent, and his body was taken to the Basilica of St. Denis, where it remained until the French Revolution, during which all graves were destroyed. His widow, Lisolette, said in a letter to the Princess of Wales, I won Monsieur over during the last three years of his life. We even used to laugh together about his weaknesses. He had confidence in me and always took my side, but before that I used to suffer dreadfully. I was just beginning to be happy when the Almighty took poor Monsieur from me. She went on to burn all the letters between Philippe and his boyfriends, afraid they would make their way into the wrong hands, saying that the scent of the perfumery on the letters nauseated her. But despite this, through the children of his marriages, he founded the House of Orleans, which was a cadet branch of the House of Bourbon. So the silliest woman in the world besides amassing a fortune for his house, beginning one of the most important art collections of all time, 
patronizing artists, creating astounding feats of architecture, and being a fucking superhero in the military, effectively became the ancestor of nearly all modern Catholic royalty and is remembered as the grandfather of Europe. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or corrections for me, feel free to email me at tawny at tawnyvoice.com or leave a comment in the comments section. See you next Tuesday. You don't have to be from Philadelphia to love the Twisted Philly podcast. There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly podcast. Hi, I'm Dina Marie, the host of Twisted Philly. Join me every week for some of my favorite stories from the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. We'll talk about true crime, haunted history, legends and local lore, plus some of my most favorite places to visit all around Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. You can follow me on social media, on Facebook at The Twisted Philly Podcast, and on Twitter at Twisted underscore Philly. And you can find my show on all major podcast apps. Plus, if you're a Patreon supporter, you get access to exclusive content twice a month that isn't available to other listeners. Join me every week in Twisted Philly. Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Rhett from the Brain Trust Brothers Network, here to talk about what we have to offer you. If you like listening to interesting people talk about themselves, then check out the Brain Trust Brothers podcast. Every Tuesday, I sit down with someone that I find interesting and talk to them about who they are and what they do. If catching up on the news surrounding Hollywood is your thing, then check out the Peanut Gallery every Saturday. With interviews from people in the industry to us nerding out about upcoming film, you are sure to get a healthy dose of all things pop culture. If you would like to learn more about us, then check out BraintrustBros.com or follow us on Twitter at BraintrustBros. We hope that you enjoy and stay tuned for what's to come from the Braintrust Brothers Network. This is Nerds with Words. Join comedians Adam Netter and Greg Trout as they take you down the rabbit hole each week with a new guest.